Okay. All right. Guess we can get started now, huh? <laughs> and so we're getting started. I need everybody to stand back up. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I've got a special treat for all of you tonight. All those years that we've been here. <laughs> and we've been doing the God's Child Yell. That's something that's real special to me. Because that didn't start with me. That started with a hero of mine. It started with my dad. And so he's here tonight. The person that coined the phrase, the original, is here to lead us all in it tonight. So let's hear it for Bobby Clark. <laughs> Mike's, Mike's hot, Dad. It's hot now. There is no better place to spend my 37th wedding anniversary to my high school sweetheart right here and celebrating with all of you and to have my son introduce me after all these years of youth ministry work and to see him on stage praising God and proclaiming his message to all of these young people here you make an old man happy Thank you, Matthew, Charlton, Charlie. All right, look, we are here and we have been praising God and this is something that we did way back in the 80s and the 90s and uh, it, was a, it, was a, uh, it was an affirmation of sorts to let everybody know no matter what the world calls you, no matter what the world labels you, no matter what you accomplish good in your life, the only thing that really matters is at the end of your life, there is going to be, for me, a little gravestone in a faraway place called Central Arkansas. And in that little place, little cemetery where there's a little white chapel, there's going to be a little gravestone, and it will say Bobby Clark. And the only thing that I've asked my sweet wife to put underneath there is just these two words, God's child. That's it. That's really the only thing that matters. And so let's rock this house right here in Lubbock, Texas. I am God's child. I am somebody. Because God don't make no joke. Amen. 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 Praise God. Okay, you can sit down. We can go home <laughs> after that. Huh? <laughs> oh, I thought you guys might like that. All right. So do I have any 14-year-olds out there? 14-year-olds. 14-year-olds, stand up. Stand up, 14-year-olds. 14, if you're 14, stand up. All right? All right, 15-year-olds. 15-year-olds, stand up. Stand up, 15-year-olds. Yes, there we go. 16? 16? Yeah. All right. 17. 17. Oh, oh, that's right. All right, and the old folks, 18. 18. Over here. All right. Oh. All right, so keep standing. Keep standing. You guys are a bunch of teenagers. All right? Teenagers. And I love talking to teenagers. And here's a big, 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 big reason why. You know, a lot of times we think of the disciples as these um, older guys in their 30s, 40s, 50s with like some kinky, curly hair and these big beards, maybe a little bit portly, uh, running around in sandals and things. But if we're going to be culturally accurate to what like a Jewish disciple was back then, then those disciples were teenagers. They were 13-year-olds. They were 14-year-olds. They were 15-year-olds. They were 16-year-olds. Those disciples that Jesus took and said, follow me and be like me. 
Let me teach you how to live this life empowered with and filled by the Holy Spirit. Let me show you what that looks like when the kingdom of heaven invades this place. And he took a handful of teenagers just like you and literally changed the world. And there's more than a handful in here tonight. So here's what you do not get to say anymore. You do not get to say, Matthew, I'm too young. I'm too young to, be, to take a significant place in the kingdom. Maybe when I'm older, maybe when I have a family, maybe when I'm settled, maybe when I'm established, but right now I'm too young. Well, thank the Lord that those disciples that were your age didn't say that because it's the reason you and I are here today. Jesus walked up out of that tomb. He said, don't go anywhere. Stick around until the Holy Spirit falls on you, till you receive power from on high. Take my message, and, and I'm going to give you this impossible task of take it to the ends of the world. And they did it. And now across the ocean, in Lubbock, Texas, with kids all over the nation descending on this place to listen to me tell you about this one that we call Savior and Lord and Jesus. It's because a bunch of kids like you said we're going to embrace the mission. Jesus is going to commission us. We're going to live like him. And that's why we're here today, sitting here in Lubbock, Texas, isn't it fun? Yeah. <laughs> All right, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Don't go to sleep. So we've been talking about this revolution, this love revolution, and what it looks like. Rob talked to us on Sunday night about the chaos of war and how God spoke into the chaos, that he spoke into the chaos, and now the onus is on us to hear God speak. What is he saying in the middle of the chaos? With all of this going on, what is God really saying? And then last night, my man C.T., Talk to us about the power of resurrection. And what it means for dead things to be brought back to life. And I can't think of anybody better for you to hear about the resurrection from than my friend Charlton. That was such a blessing to me. Was it a blessing to you guys? Yeah. <laughs> fun when your best friends that you look up to are your biggest cheerleaders. That's good life. That's the abundant life. Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 5. Don't judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? And pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus says, don't judge. Don't be a hypocrite. You're going around with this big giant plank in your eye and knocking people out and saying, hey, hold on, hold on, hey, hey, stop right there. Let me, let me tweeze that speck out of your eye. Don't do that. Don't judge. Don't be a hypocrite. Take the plank out of your own eye first before you go around for any kind of speck removal. You know what the biggest hang-up for non-believers is? A lot of times we think, man, well, this is a dark world. It's all the sin, all the evil that goes on all around us. But most often, the biggest hang-up for a non-believer 
becoming a believer, for a non-Jesus follower, becoming a Jesus follower, the biggest barrier between them is us. It's Christians. It's the church. It's those of us that call ourselves Jesus followers. It's guys like me that wear made for his glory shirts, even though I love this shirt. <laughs> but it's us. That's the barrier between them. That's the thing that they can't get past. I mean, it's all throughout history. How many wars have been started in the name of Jesus? How, how many coats of armor have been put on with a, with a cross on? How many villages and towns have been plundered in Jesus' name for the sake of the church, for the movement of Christianity? How many innocent people have been fleeced and robbed so that we can advance our agenda, so we can advance Christianity? And it's not just back then. It's not just, oh, yeah, back in the dark ages, but we're a little better now. We're a little more refined. We may be more refined, but we still have our crusades, right? We still have our, our, our shirts with our crosses on it. We still, we still have different ways of, of, of plundering villages and things like that. We just do it in different ways. But the biggest hang-up so often is us. And we're saying, hey, we want to we invite you world to be a part of what we got going on here. And they're saying, well, thanks, but no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. You guys are a bunch of hypocrites. And I don't even know, who, who even uses that word, hypocrites? Sounds like an insect, but people use it when they talk about us. You guys are hypocrites. All of a sudden, we're all versed in, in Greek and Latin. You guys are hypocrites. When we talk about the church, you guys are, that church is full of hypocrites. You say one thing and you do another. Well, let me tell you something, friend. Jesus has changed my life. Really? Jesus really changed your life? He really changed your life because your life doesn't look any different from mine. We're still at the same parties. We're still sitting there sipping on the same solo cup. We're still passing the same whatever around. We're still pursuing the same guys and girls, the same virtueless and valueless guys and girls trying to hook up with them just like I am. Jesus really changed your life? It doesn't look like it, and the world is standing up, and they are shouting at us, prove it. Jesus really changed your life? Prove it. Show me something different because your life looks just like mine. You guys are a bunch of hypocrites. You say one thing, and you do another. Well, Matt, they don't want to follow my rules. Well, I wouldn't want to follow your rules either. You don't want to follow them yourself. That's not a very inviting invitation. Come be like us. Come be a part of this family. And the world is saying, prove it. Come on, just prove it. Show me something different. Show me a life that's different. Show me a life that really is transformed. And see, Jesus, he had a, he had a strategy. He had a plan to deal with this. He said, this is how the world, the same world that's hollering at you, thanks, but no thanks, and prove it. He said, this is how the world is going to know that you really are my disciples, those that follow me, that I really am who I say I am, and that he really sent me, that I'm really the son of God. He said, here's how the world is going to know. Rob mentioned it on Sunday night, John 13, by the way that you love each other. That's how they're going to know. And he took it a step further in John 17. The world is going to know. Let them be one like we are one. Let them have a unity like us so that the world will know that Jesus really is who he says he is and that God sent him. It's by looking at us, seeing this is how people love each other. This is how they're unified with each other. Even when they don't always agree, they stick. You see what Jesus didn't say? He says it's not going to be the miracles. It's not going to be the signs. It's not going to be the wonders that tell the world that I am who I say I am. And I believe in all of that stuff. I believe in the miracles and in the signs and the wonders. And I, I, I believe that Jesus really is still in the business 
of opening blind eyes, of opening deaf ears, of telling the lame person to get up and walk, of multiplying food and resources, of calming seas and calming storms and resurrecting things and bringing dead things back to life. I believe all of that, that he does all of that through the Holy Spirit, and he still does it today, but Jesus did not say, that's how the world is going to know that you guys and that you guys are really who you say you are, and I'm really who I say I am and that he really sent me he said the world is going to know by the way that you love each other this revolutionary type love that you express to each other the way that you stick when even you don't agree and they see something in you they see a family in you that you still love each other even though you don't always seem like you get along but you love each other anyway and in that love in that crazy type of love the people actually start to say there is something to that Jesus that they follow. There is something to that God that they call the one true God that they bow down to. And we see this barrier start to go like this. Because of the way that we love each other in such a radical and revolutionary way. In the way that we are united with each other, just like Jesus is with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The way that we are community together. And the world looks on that, and they say Jesus must be who he says he is. That that one that they call God must be the one true God. Jesus dealt with this with his disciples, and it's kind of a, and kind of a, just a weird, crazy chapter in Luke chapter 9 that he dealt with with all of this. And in the beginning of Luke chapter 9, he brings all of his disciples with him, these guys that had been following him. He brings all of his disciples and he said, listen, I'm going to give you power and authority to drive out demons, to heal the sick, to cure all kinds of diseases. All you got to do is go preach the kingdom of God and heal sick people everywhere you go and drive out demons everywhere you go. And so guess what they did? They did exactly that. They went from village to village preaching the kingdom of God, demonstrating the kingdom of God. This is what, happened, this is what happens when God's kingdom reigns. Sickness, gone. Demons, gone. They went back to Jesus, they're high-fiving each other, and they start telling stories about all their successes in ministry. They feed the 5,000, they see Jesus in this crazy scene on the Mount of Transfiguration, and there he is. And we don't even get to the end of the chapter. And these guys that are preaching the kingdom of God, that are healing the sick, that are casting out demons, that are curing all kinds of diseases, these same guys, they start to look around at each other and they start to go, "Mm, yeah, yeah, well, you know, Andrew's got like four or five under his belt and James maybe six or seven and I'm, you know, I've got 13 cured diseases to my name and they start going like this and saying, who's the greatest? So who's the greatest among us? Well, if I'm compared to you, then maybe I look a little greater there. But if I walk over here, over here, then maybe I'm not so great. So who is the greatest? They start to ask this question, and this, this stuff starts to surface in their heart. And <laughs> Charlton, Charlton mentioned last night <laughs> that it was, you know, it's too bad Jesus didn't take a selfie on his way jumping out of the tomb. Ha, suckers. Yeah, that was pretty good. And so, too bad he didn't take it. And so I got to thinking about that. You know, it is a good thing that these disciples in Luke chapter 9 did not have any access to social media. I mean, could you imagine these guys have access to Facebook accounts, Instagram accounts, Twitter accounts, they're just snapping each other all day long. Hey, let's let's come up with a six-second bond. This one's going to be good. It's It's a good thing that they didn't have access to social media. I mean, I can, I, can imagine, I can imagine James on his little Facebook post. Yeah, healed 17 diseases today, drove out 19 demons, slow day at work post. <laughs> or with Andrew on his Twitter saying, we're going, going to do some demon stomping today, just fed 5,000 hashtag hungry. And so... <laughs> 
And then, if, you know, I think, of, I think of Peter with an Instagram account. Oh, my goodness. You know, it, what's his handle going to be? Is it going to be at Disciple Ninja or is it going to be at Patty Juan Pete or something like that? And, and so here he is rolling through and it's Selfie Sunday. Boom. Yeah. It's Man Crush Monday. Who else? Me. And it's an it, outfit of the day. This is, my, this is my Jedi robe and my demon stomping sandals. Holla. And then, on, and then it's Woman Crush Wednesday, and that's got to be his wife, but right next to her, Man Crush Monday. And then Throwback Thursday, this is me as a, a fisherman. I, I don't know why Peter is a fly fisherman all of a sudden. But this is, <laughs> this, is me, this is me as a fisherman, but now a fish for men. That sounded, that sounded kind of strange. I'm sorry. But, but, <laughs> but I'm glad. <laughs> but so I'm glad it's a good thing it's a good thing these guys didn't have access to social media and this condition starts developing in their heart I mean there's crazy things I mean, we're not even out of the, the chapter yet and Jesus sees this going on and he says listen I know what you guys are thinking you guys are measuring each other up who's the greatest bring me a little kid Whoever welcomes him welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes my father, the one who sent me. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, be the least. Be like a little child. You want to answer that question, who's the greatest? Be like a kid. Pursue me like a child. Have a faith like a little kid. Then you can call yourself the greatest. And so John is scrambling around. He's trying to figure things out. And he's like, oh, we got to save ourselves here. Well, Jesus, let me tell you something. We saw some people trying to, we saw some people driving out some demons in your name. And guess what we did? We told them to stop. Hey, you better let them keep their demons. Because we're the only ones that drive out demons in the name of Jesus here. Excuse me, ma'am, family. You guys take your demons back and go home. Because this is an exclusive club. This is boys only here. And we're the ones that drive out demons in the name of Jesus. And I'm like, where? And Jesus like, where are we going with this thing? And too bad that wasn't the worst part because then they're heading to a Samaritan village. They get on down the road. Jesus sends some messengers. Hey, go make some arrangements for us to stay there. They find out, oh, you guys are going to Jerusalem? No, no, no. Samaritans hate Jews. And so that means we hate you guys. So, so you are not welcome here. And uh-oh. Uh oh, you just made the sons of thunder mad. James and John, oh no, uh uh, uh uh, you're not gonna welcome me, you're not gonna welcome us. Do you know who we are? You know, you know what our track record was last week for stomping some demons? Jesus, and this is really what they said, <laughs> this is crazy. Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and wipe out the entire village? And Jesus got to be scratching his head. I mean, where, where did we go? Where did we derail here? I mean, we started out so good. You guys are doing exactly what I told you. Preach the kingdom. Demonstrate the kingdom. Heal the sick. Drive out demons. Cure diseases. And they were doing that. And then, oh, we're not even out of the chapter yet. And they're saying, Lord, let us bring fire on an entire village and kill them all. And so these conditions start to surface. And we start to see that it's the heart that needs to be dealt with. That it's attitudes that need to be changed. You see, here's the point. The revolution starts with us. All of this talk that we've been doing, all the love revolution starts with you and it starts with me. It starts with your heart. Jesus changing your heart. It starts with your attitude. Jesus shifting your attitude saying, think like me. Think from another realm into this one. Don't just think from earth to earth. Think from heaven to earth. It starts with us and the disciples they got a taste of that love revolution they got a taste of what that was really like they embraced the commission of Jesus to preach the kingdom of God in all of its love and grace and mercy and to demonstrate that and to see sickness run because it doesn't get to stay that kind of 
in the presence of that kind of love. They got to see demons flee because you don't get to stay here. You don't belong here. That kind of evil doesn't get to exist here. And they got to watch the kingdom of God advance. They got to see, just taste what this revolution is really like. And not even a chapter later. Who's the greatest? This prideful attitude starts rising up. Who's the greatest? This exclusive attitude starts saying, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, mm-mm. We're the only ones who get to do this stuff. We don't you don't get to join. This is just us. You don't get to play. And even into this, this murderous mindset, let's wipe out an entire village. Love you with the love of the Lord. Now we call down fire on your city. <laughs> Good night, sleep tight. We hope you burn up quickly. <laughs> but remember, we love you with the love of the Lord. I mean, it is that ridiculous, the shift that happened in that moment. It's that crazy. It's comical to us, but it's what happened. And Jesus, like you guys need to be reminded of what I told you on the Sermon on the Mount. Don't judge. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't say one thing and do another. Don't preach one gospel and then want to call fire down on an entire city in the next breath. Don't just say one thing and do another. Let everything match up with you. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be like that. So for us, just like it was for them, it's about removing the plank. Taking the plank, having the plank removed from our lives so that we can actually see clearly. So we can see things for what they really are. It's your heart condition first. It's my heart condition first. It starts with our transformation. Jesus does want to change the world. We can all agree on that. But he's doing it, and he's starting with you. And with you, and with you, and with me, and with all of us. He's starting with us first. He's looking into your heart, and he's starting with your heart first. He's starting with your plank removal. And I don't know what that is for you. I don't know the planks in your life. I don't know this, this hidden stuff that you've got going on that you've, you've tucked away down deep. I don't know the things that you deal with or things that you're trying to hide. It's like it's just easier not to ever have to deal with these. It's easier not to confess these things. It's easier just not to bring them up in the first place. But we've got to deal with the planks in our own lives. We've got to deal with our own hearts first. We want to see a love revolution? It starts with us. It starts with you. It starts with you doing the hard work now. It starts with us having the courage to confess, to release. One thing I do know, and this is good, I know a guy. He's pretty good at removing planks. I know a guy that was stretched out across a plank, that was nailed to a plank to take care of the planks in your life and in my life. His name is Jesus. He's the only one worthy. But he did it. He took care of it. And he took care of it forever. I want you to stand with me. We're not done yet, so don't get too excited. (laughs) 
fixing to watch a worship video. Um, some of you may know it. It's one of my favorite worship songs. Uh, it's just about Jesus. It's just about who He is. Who He really is. The way that He deals with the planks in our life. And how He dealt with them forever. You see, our resurrected King... He wasn't really messing around. He wasn't just kind of throwing things out there. Yeah, hope it sticks, hope it works. When he said it is finished, minute, that means forever. For you and for me. So we're going to watch this video, but I want you to do something. I want you to prepare your heart right now in this moment. Prepare your heart to receive something from God. As these words just wash over us, just prepare your heart to receive all that he would give you in this moment. And also, prepare your heart to release, to get rid of, to see things gone forever. Revolution starts with us. It starts with our heart, our attitudes, our plank removal. So turn your attention and your affection towards Him. Be expectant that you are going to receive something from Him. And then He's going to start to rise within you the courage to release all that needs to be released. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross his blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon Him One final breath He gave As heaven looked away the Son of God was laid in darkness A battle in the grave A war on death was waged The power of hell forever broken The ground began to shake The stone was rolled away His perfect love could not Death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. And now forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Yeah.
is overcome oh that's right that's him that's our resurrected king it's finished forever revolution starts with us with our transformation with our hearts being changed forever forever and you don't bow down to a king that left any loopholes in that deal you serve the resurrected king. Listen, transformation is a big, big deal. Transformed hearts and minds lead to transformed people. Transformed people lead to transformed cities. Transformed cities lead to transformed states. Transformed states lead to transformed nations. And I still believe that Jesus, the one that we call our resurrected king, is the desire of the nations. Amen. So transformation is a big deal. And there's only one way to transformation. That's through the one that removes planks forever. He really meant it when he said, it's finished. With him being nailed to a plank to take care of our planks, it was with the end goal in mind that we would see clearly that we would actually see things for what they really are. That you could see God for who he really was. And that you could see yourself for who you really are. That you could see your purpose and your destiny. The purity and the power that you are supposed to walk in. That you could see your value and your worth. And I know some of you, maybe a lot of you, walked in here. Think, well, Matt, I don't know how valuable I am. Well, I don't feel very valuable, and I don't feel like I'm worth much. Well, too bad. It doesn't matter how you feel, because your value isn't based on your feelings. Your value is determined by what someone is willing to pay. If I've got a handful of dirt, and I'm not willing to give a dime for that handful of dirt. But somebody is willing to give me a million dollars for this handful of dirt. Guess what my handful of dirt is worth? It's worth a million dollars. Even though I wouldn't give a dime for it. And do you know what the God of the universe looked out and said about all of you? Do you know what he said about your value and your worth? He said it's going to take the highest price known to the universe, this, the blood of my son, to buy them just so that I can have a chance with him, the, him and her, but I am willing to pay that price. I am willing to set that kind of worth, that kind of value on you and on me. You're valuable. You're worth it. He proved it. Jesus died. He got up out of that tomb so that we could live the lives that we were destined to live. And there's a couple of things that drive me in this lifetime. One, that he deserves to be known. Maybe nobody else in the universe, but he deserves to be known. And the second one is that he deserves to get what he paid for. So tonight, I want you to experience what it means for the king to get what he paid for. He paid so you didn't have to walk around with a plank in your eye all the time. He paid for that. 
He didn't pay for you to hold on to it, for you to tuck it away, for you to bury it, for you to hide it. He paid for that. So push it out. Push it out into the light. Push it out there where he can deal with it. See, God is always trying to move us from a place of theory where we think something is true into an experience so that we step into a place of reality where I don't just think it's true anymore. I know it's true. I've experienced what it means to have a plank removed in my life. So tonight, I want you to experience what it means to be set free from the chains, from the bondage of sin and the planks that you carry around that maybe you've tucked away, that maybe you've buried for so long. I'm going to invite some guys, some youth ministers, some leaders and their wives up here right now. And they're going to come up here and we're going to enter into this time of ministry. We're going to do things a little bit different tonight. We're not going to come up here and write on cards our prayer request. If you want to give your life to Jesus, be united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection, in baptism, then fill out a card. But tonight, we're taking care of some planks that he already paid for. These guys that are up here, they're going to be spread out over that way too. These are some heroes of mine. That's why, we're up, that's why they're up here. And I know, I know that many of them are spiritual heroes of yours. I know they are. I know you come year after year, year after year, saying, I want to be like him like he's trying to be like Jesus. I want to be like her like she's trying to be like Jesus. Guess what? I want you to be brave, and here's your chance. For one of my heroes, some of your heroes, to pray and to speak life into you. For you to confess something, not so that they can look at you in shame, but that they can be proud of you and that you can watch your hero be proud of you as you push something out there to be dealt with forever. Amen. So I want you to be brave. In a minute, I'm going to pray. If one of these people is up here for you, then come up here. Have them pray into your life. We're going to spread out that way, and we're going to spread out that way. Those lights are going to be on, and those lights are going to be on. And we're going to use this whole entire stage. I'm going to be here. My wife is going to be here. Listen, if you walked in here dealing with some real shame in your life, a shame that binds you, that, 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 just, that just tangles you up, that you feel enslaved by, then I want you specifically to let my man Charlton pray for you. Because that's a man that's walked through the shame and walked on the other side of that and knows the truth of Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Amen. Those of us that are in Christ Jesus. If you walked in here in some hopeless state. Like, I don't know how I'm going to make it through the next month. I don't know how I'm going to make it through the next week. I don't know how I'm going to make it through the next day. I want you to find my wife. And I want you to let her pray into your life as somebody that's walked through the hopelessness and found hope in Jesus on the other side. Amen. A hope that she holds on to, not just for a day, but forever. And for some of you out there, some of you were like me. You rolled through life, you're rolling through high school right now as cowards. That you just wish this passion that was on the inside of you matched up with what you did on the outside because on the outside, you're just everything to everybody. You just wish you had some courage. You just wish you had some power to be who you know you should be. If that's you, you come find me. I'm gonna pray for you. Because I don't want you to live a life without power, and without courage to be who God created you to be. And for the rest of us out here, listen, there's going to be some of you that are, that are going to be, God is going to be moving you in your seats right there. You don't have to be up here for ministry to happen. This is an invitation to come. 
but also to go. We had a whole bunch of people over here last night. The Lord was dealing with and the Lord was doing great work over there. But there were a whole bunch of you in pockets around this place with stuff going on. Listen, you don't have to be a professional to be a part of the ministry of Jesus. Amen. The same Holy Spirit that empowers and fills me, that empowers and fills all of them, is the same Holy Spirit that empowers and fills all of you Jesus followers out there, is the same Holy Spirit that filled and empowered those apostles, that filled and empowered Jesus himself, Amen. the Son of God. And he's here. He's here with us. And so I'm going to pray. And it's an invitation for you to come and to let these people, these men and women, these leaders, these heroes, these giants speak life into you, to bless you, for you to push stuff out on the table and say, tonight, this is it. I've got to get rid of it. It's gone. Jesus paid for it. I believe it. It's over. It's also an invitation to go, to be who God called you to be, to minister to each other, to love each other, to show the world he really does exist. God really sent him. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come and fill this place and to blow through us again. Father, thank you for the way that you love us, the way that you teach us to love. Help us to love the same. Lord, I just pray a blessing of great courage over every heart here. Let them be bold. Let them be brave. That you would open their eyes and their ears and that they would just do what you're prompting them to do in these next few moments so good and you're so kind to us living life with you is the privilege of a lifetime let us embrace that and thank you for paying the price to take care of all the planks that ever existed that ever will exist in our lives and it's in the name of Jesus that I ask and that I bless and that we all pray amen amen